All right, guys. Well, here we are going on a little field trip. Um, you know, I'm staying at my parents' house. Kind of hard to do videos while I'm there. So this is going to be kind of an interesting video. So I'm going to show you. I got a great story for where I'm going. You know, so I'm leaving my parents' house. And I'm going to a place that Karina and I pretty much used to live at, you know, um, you know, the story when I got out the second time after I'd gotten the DUI. Oh, here I am. Oh, my headphones are like busting people in the neighborhood think I'm like a creep. Um, but anyway, um, when I'd gone out of prison for the second time and I met Karina, you know, in the beginning I was living with my parents, but I used to sneak her in. And I'd like see us like blowing cum bubbles and I'd be like, hey, hey, we talked about cum bubbles. I was like, Dad, I thought you understand. He's like, you smell like beating off. I'm like, no, I haven't been beating off. I've just been having sex with a hot woman. You're always overreacting. I always think I'm up to no good. Um, so in the beginning, you know, I mean, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell you guys something really good. This is one I've been saving for a while. This has been really hard to do content lately. Um, just been so busy and been in hotels and, you know, it's like by the time I can sit down and actually do a video, I'm just completely exhausted. Um, but anyway, um, in the beginning... My, I mean, it started off bad, you know, Karina and I's relationship. Um, because my parents, they've, they've always been cool about, you know, having girls sleep over. But they get mad if it's like every day. You know, my parents are kind of like stuck in their ways. You know, they're super, they're like, they're cool. They've always been cool parents. But... Like I said, they're like stuck in their ways. And one of the rules that they've always had is that girls can't sleep over more than a few nights. So I like rent a random like black dude. And I'm like, hey, it's just my black friend, Gary. Gary's like, what up? Sometimes I sleep over at Ryan's, you know, just because I heard that you don't like him fucking girls on the down low. No, I've never done that. But, um, so... The first time that they ever met Karina, Karina came over with her friend, her best friend, who's transgender, you know, and uh, you know, I joke a lot about gay people and about transgender people, but truth be told, like, I fully have always been okay with that shit, you know? Well, I mean, not me personally, like, I've never solicited a butt fucking from anyone, but I don't judge people. And what's interesting, I, I remember, I think I told this story during the Pimping and Pandering series, but I knew her best friend when she was a dude, you know? I grew up with him, went to school with him, used to play soccer with him. Um, we weren't like super good friends or anything, but it's like probably third night that Karina came over, she brought her best friend. You know, and best friend, like I said, transgender, has fake boobs, looks like a girl. And, uh, you know, we had gone to the liquor store. I didn't have a job back then, you know, and Karina was working at a, like a really fancy hair salon. So she basically was paying for everything. That particular night, we went to this liquor store, you know, because Karina was full blown alcoholic back in that time period. I mean, she's legitimately she didn't just drink heavily like she was the worst alcoholic that i've ever met in my entire life um that was female you know and, and aside from her you know paul was probably the worst because he got the shakes and everything i thought that that was just like shit in the movies you know i didn't think that people really got delirium tremens but i saw paul you know when we were roommates you know he would shake and it was He'd wake up drinking vodka out of the bottle and he'd be like trying to 
put the bottle up to his mouth and it'd be like shaking, pouring down his chin. You know, there's nothing funny about it. It was actually really pathetic. And I always felt bad for him. And after I saw Paul like that, I knew that it was like, you know, it was like a real thing. I got like that in 2016, you know, um, when I had left rehab with that girl, Haley, and she taught me how to drink like an alcoholic, you know, she literally said that she's like, Hey man, well, she didn't talk like that, but she's like, I don't get it. You spend like a hundred dollars a day on heroin. That's fucking stupid. You could get annihilated for $30 a day. I'm going to teach you how to be a drunk. I was like, all right. She's like, the first thing is that you need to not smell so good. You need to throw away your 3.4 ounce Tommy Cabana cologne. I was like, I'm not, I was like, look, you know, I have you a lot of things. I'm definitely not the kind of dude that goes without my Tommy Cabana. So we broke it and we we're living with that transvestite down in San Diego. And she would wake me up with screwdrivers and she, you know, constantly drink beer. Like if I didn't have a beer in hand, she'd go, like, whoa, whoa, you need to drink another one. You're not going to be a real alcoholic if you don't drink all day. So, you know, and I never liked alcohol, you know, I was talking to someone, one of my close friends the other day, who's a meth addict. And he was saying that the first time he drank alcohol, it was like some cathartic experience. He's like, yeah, I heard mariachi music in my mind. Got the first boner I'd had in like six years. Started drawing. I didn't even know how to draw before. I was drawing like eloquent fucking sketch paintings and shit. And I was like, huh? You know, a lot of people say that like in AA. You know, they'll say that the first time that they drank was some profound experience. And I didn't have that, you know. I used to drink in high school. And I used to get drunk to go to school. But I also used to smoke weed to go to school and I hated weed and really truth be told I hated alcohol you know I had been reduced to the jester you know the guy that would just drink a whole bottle of Captain Morgan's be puking and someone would be like look at that fucking idiot I'd be like do you guys like me they're like fuck yeah you're the fucking coolest idiot we know idiot and they like spit on me because I was hanging out with older kids you know when I was a freshman I hang out with a bunch of seniors they're like maintenance dudes at golf courses now. But I thought they were the coolest motherfuckers back then. And when I got out of high school, really when I started doing heroin, because heroin and alcohol tend to not mix that well, you know. Definitely makes you sick. And, you know, I just, once I found heroin, I didn't have to drink. So I didn't drink anymore. You know, I used to get drunk to just to go to school. And then when I got on cocaine, when I was doing an eight ball a day, I would drink with that. Because when my parents adopted my best friend when I was 16, he was a legitimate alcoholic too. He didn't get the shakes, he does now, but he didn't then. And uh, so, you know, I drank, I thought I was partying, but it's definitely not normal, you know, to be ditching school if you don't have alcohol because you can't face reality without booze thought it was normal then you know i was listening to a lot of bob dylan i was like he's talking about me i'm fucking wasted so what ends up happening is i become physically addicted to alcohol in 2016 you know i uh i'd started drinking mickey's 40s after Haley and i broke up we broke up i moved in with jeff and he had this huge cha um, change jar, change that he had been collecting for like, you know, years. There's like buffalo nickels in it and shit. It was like some old ass antique coin collection. Now, back then, Wasting Talent, my book, was probably bringing me like 1200 bucks a month on average, I think, at that period. It's so right around the time that I sold the French rights, you know, and I got six grand for that. But, you know, I, when you smoke cigarettes, I wasn't doing heroin, you know, at that point, it was like a little period where I'd just gotten off, I'd gotten kicked out of my sober living, and uh, I showed up at Jeff's door with a suitcase, gave me a hug, and he let me come in. So, I'd spend all my royalty money on cigarettes and food 
in Mickey's, you know? And during that period, I was like going on dating apps and like finding girls and they'd like come over and like have sex with me sometime if I was lucky. I mean, I didn't look great at that period. You know, I was drinking Mickey's pretty much all day and I'd wake up drinking and then, I don't know, I was maybe drinking like five or six of them a day. Now, Mickey's, I believe, is equivalent to about three and a half beers because it's malt liquor. So I was drinking like, you know, over 20 drinks of alcohol a day at that point. And I didn't think I had a drinking problem. I didn't know. You know, I had a this girl that I started seeing that uh, she was an ex-stripper. She had kids. She had dated somebody that I went to high school with. He beat her. She lived like an hour away from me and she was sober. She was in AA. She was like a recovering alcoholic. And she, I used to drive out to her and I'd be, I'd be drunk, you know? And she, she like didn't like it, but I don't know. I think she, she liked me enough where she tolerated it. And eventually during that period, I got a fan letter for my ex-wife and right around that time I had an agent agent secured me French rides for my book you know it took a month of negotiating you know I think at first they want to give me like three grand she got it all the way up to six thousand so I got a check for six thousand right around the time that um that I got that fan letter you know fan letter went something like um, you know, I'm your biggest fan, read your book, I'm a single mom, I live in Denver, and, uh, and that's that, right? I didn't see, it was in my Facebook messages, like, in that folder where it's like, weirdos, you know, it's like, hey man, we fagged off one time, I met up on Craigslist when you were high on crystal meth, I'm like, yeah, I don't feel like answering that, dude. And I get this fan letter from her. Now, back then, my book was selling pretty good, but I didn't get a lot of fan letters, you know? Nowadays, I do, you know? People send me butthole shots from all over the world. It's like African butthole shots with like seashell fucking anal beads sticking out. I'm like, fucking fire. Trina, check that. She's like, oh my God, those seashells look like they stink. So, finally, I am on Jeff's couch and he, one day, he just comes up and dumps a trash bag full of Mickey's. There's like a hundred bottles in there. He's like, hey bro, I think you have a drinking problem. I was like, I don't have a drinking problem. I'm not homeless, I don't wear flannel. You know what the fuck are you talking about? Paul has a drinking problem. I don't have one, I don't get the shakes. And that was the first time anybody had ever called me out on it. And I did, I had a legitimate drinking problem. I think that, you know, from what I've observed, throughout the years um it's easy for heroin addicts to um you know get strung out on alcohol if you've been addicted to heroin and you're used to being down you know it's it's it, just because i didn't like alcohol um didn't mean that i didn't cling on to that feeling you know, because alcohol is kind of like heroin in a sense where it's a, it's a warmth, you know, it's a blanket and it gives you comfort. And, you know, I'd already done the five years in prison and I had bad PTSD. My fiance left me. So I, you know, I had things to drink about. I was like, I'm going to start writing poetry too. Fuck it. Watch me. It's like lame rhyming poetry. I was like, whoa, watch. I'll draw, I'll draw roses on the fucking binder paper too. Jeff's like, you know, the, the roses really kick it off. I'm like, yeah, I know. So when I met my ex-wife, I respond to that letter. And she's like, where do you live? And I'm like, well, you know, L.A. You know, I was actually homeless living on Jeff's couch. Not legitimately homeless like I've been, but I didn't have a house. I did have like a nice X5 Beamer that I got. That was like the nicest thing I had, like... It's like a 2009 SUV. This is in like 2016. So it's pretty nice. Black upholstery and everything. It's like the sports package. And I respond to her. We start talking. I'm dating that other girl, the, the ex-stripper with the kids that I had to drive like an hour each way to see. And um, 
But what ends up happening is she, you know, she's like, oh, I used to live in LA. You know, um, I go there sometimes. If we're ever there, we should grab a drink. I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah. I'm a loser alcoholic now, let's do this. And she's like, or we could take some Molly. You know, which, what does that translate to? That translates to, hey, I'm trying to have sex with you. And at that time, I was attracted to her, you know? She's a blonde girl. You know, I'm not, I, I never really dated blondes, but she had like fake boobs and I was never like a boob guy. I was always an ass guy, but something about her, I don't know. She seemed innocent, you know? And like at that point, after my ex-fiance, which was a real relationship, like that's someone I actually cared about. Um, after her, I was just with hood rats. They'd like be having sex or like, hey, gotta take this road flare out of my ass. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Why do you carry that? Just in case anybody tries to get crazy with me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's normal. It fits in your ass. They're like, oh yeah. So when this girl writes me, you know, she says that she's an executive assistant, single mom, and I buy into it. So when I get the French royalty money, I fly her out. We go on this insane drug vendor, GHB, cocaine, um, a lot of Molly. We end up getting married. You know the story. And that year of me being married to her is absolutely disastrous, tumultuous. All sorts of horrible shit happens. Then I get the DUI. I go to prison. Three months. It's, you know, three months. I met Big Meech, whatever. I get out. I catch the pimping case. And then I meet Karina. When I met Karina, you know the story. Went out for dinner. I went in to kiss her. And she's like, wow. Pushes my shoulder. She's like, I don't even know you. And I was rejected. It was like the first time I've ever been rejected. Not to say that I'm some stud or anything. I mean, I'm hot. I'm tan. Whatevs. You know? No, I'm just kidding. But, um... You know, I'd never been rejected because I tend to read um, signals, you know? I mean, if I see a road flare, I'm like, that. she's down to date. <laughs> yeah, what up? I use that for protection. She's like, oh my God, how'd you know? Guys, I relapsed on cigarettes. It sucks. I mean, dealing with all this shit with my mom, it's just been, it's just been tough. So I'm going to smoke. Don't freak out. About five minutes after Karina rejects me, she goes, um, I know this is awkward, but do you want to go back to my salon and bang? And I did. I took her back to her salon. We had sex on her boss's swivel chair. I came everywhere, you know, which is, you know, whatever. Came out like I had some prostate problem. It's like, <laughs> it was like all spider webbed out. She's like, ow, oh, I bet that stinks. And... We had this drunk fling because she knew that I was going to prison. I told her about the pimping and pandering. Red flag that she was okay with that. I'm like, have you ever been with someone that's on bail for pimping and pandering? She's like, just a few. Oh, all right. Well, I'm one of those few. We have this drunk fling and I loved her, you know, but I wasn't in love with her. And she wasn't in love with me. And there was like, you know kind of cheating stuff going on emotional cheating you know just a bunch of bullshit and when I went to and then I had my breakdown and when I went to prison I really fell in love with her you know I, I love her more than anything she's my best friend I, I, I'm completely in love with her now but not in the beginning you know beginning she was an obnoxious drunk and so was I the point of the story and this is going to lead into something good. I'm just warming up, you know, because I haven't been doing stuff lately. We used to walk to this place. I don't know if you can see it. But this is a park by my parents' house. Right here on this four stair, I saw a kid break his arm when we were skateboarding when we were kids. He tried to ollie that set. He leaned back. He broke his arm. Um... And this place is just, it's just this big, beautiful park, you know, and there's some offices here and there's also a movie theater, you know, someday if I really make it big, 
which I think I will. I'm going to try to. I want to buy this, name it after my parents, you know? Um, but Karina and I used to come here because there's not security, you know? I had my, my, uh, no, I didn't have my car. You know, sometimes we have my mom's car, but, you know, my parents would kick us out we would come to this place, you know? And, uh, I mean, we had sex here, you know, just like, I'm going to walk around and show you some of the places we fucked up. So it's just ridiculous. I mean, we were wiling out. We were straight up alcoholics, drunk, not giving a fuck. So this little courtyard this is where I want to get married to her too, because there's so many memories. But we used to walk into this courtyard. I know it's hard to see. I just didn't want to record a video at my parents' house. But we used to go into this courtyard. Watch, there's going to be light. We'd walk in here. And when I was a kid, when I was in high school, I used to come here and there used to be ashtrays everywhere. And I would take refries, you know? Because back then, you know, I think my parents gave me five bucks a day for lunch. I couldn't always afford cigarettes. So I would come here and I would get refries. There used to be ashtrays right here. But me and her would come here at like two in the morning after we got kicked into my parents. And she would hang on to this rail. And I would bone her right here. Take out the road flirt and just fucking hit it, you know? But, uh, you know, we never got caught. And we come here quite a bit. This is where I want to get married. Now, this is where the story comes in. This is a fucking really interesting story. So, <clears throat> when I was 20, this might start off a whole series, you know? And so sorry for, like, you know, the, the long recap stuff. But, like I said, I was just trying to warm up. But when I was like 21, right after I got back from Connecticut, when I was living with those that homeless couple, uh, and all that shit went down when Kate's dad tried to pay me to stay away from her, the stuff with JP, Luke, all those people, I moved in with my parents for a little bit after I'd gotten caught fucking a girl, doggy style in a shower. Like a good scumbag. And I didn't tell Karina I was leaving. She might like call. The video ends suddenly, that's what happened. I'll blink twice if I'm okay. I moved in with my parents after that. I had met Jenny, all that stuff. But after I got back from Connecticut, I would come get refries here. See, this was always my spot to get refries. It was kind of embarrassing, too. Like, you know, there's offices here. You know, this is this is an office building. And I would just go. I didn't give a fuck. There'd be, like, ashtrays. And I would just go and I'd just scoop them up, put it in a sandwich bag, come back later and smoke them. You know, there's footage in the documentary of me grabbing refries at this very spot. And people would look at me mortified. That some like rabid acne face junkie had escaped rehab or something. Come here and scoop up cigarettes. It was like, kind of like those like arcade games where you can like scoop up prizes. I would just like get my hand like a claw and go and just grab all the refries I could, put them in a plastic bag, go home and smoke them. I didn't, I didn't re-roll them or anything. I would just hit the, the filter. You know, I mean, there'd be like lipstick stains on it and shit. So I started kind of frequenting. Well, I, I certainly was frequenting this area that I just showed you. I'm going to walk back now. I don't know if there's like security. What are you doing? I'm making content. What does that mean? Show us the video. I'm like talking about butt fucking and like flares and like African seashell necklaces. I'm like, hey, man. Are you on that shit? No, I swear it's just content. It's entertainment. So, I come here one day. You know, and it was the first time I met this guy named Henry. 
Now, Henry was like some sorry ass sap, right? Kind of chubby. He had like, he had bangs, you know? He'd wear like collared shirts with spaghetti stains on them. And Henry, and the reason I gave you all that backstory with Kareen and everything is because it has to do with what is going to come in the story. So he was homeless, you know, but he had a truck. He had like, you know, some truck with like a camper shell on it. And he, uh, he would sit on this bench at that place that I just showed you all day long drinking. You know, I wasn't an alcoholic yet. I was like 21, very much addicted to heroin. So any money I had went to my heroin habit. I definitely didn't have money to buy cigarettes. And when I didn't have money to buy cigarettes, the refries, there were so many people that work there who would support my habit, right? And so I started running into this guy, Henry, and one day I meet him. And I go up to him, I was like, hey man, do you work here? He's like, nah fucking homeless i was like oh no way i could like smell him he smelled homeless i was like oh no way man that sucks what happened he's like i don't want to talk about it right this is the first time i met him and you know i'd see him around but i started talking to him more and more you know and, uh, well, that was a cop. There's a cop right here. Damn, this is a good story. This cop doesn't fuck with me. I'm gonna, like, have to explain to him, like, yeah, I'm creating content. So, anyway, um, first time I'd asked him about like I'm like all right so you're homeless you hang out here I was like do you smoke refries he's like who doesn't and so my first impression of this guy was that he was basically competition for me you know he was the kind of guy that I had to like go to this complex early or else he was going to get the choice refries became these like refry wars you know it was an unspoken thing like we never mentioned it but like you could tell this guy knew what my gig was i mean he saw me doing it and he would have like a i don't know if it was a shoe box but something like that like a little like cardboard box with all the stuff he would collect he had weird shit in there he'd have like mcdonald's happy meal toys I'd be like, what is that? Why do you have that? Do you have kids? He's like, no. I sell them, man, if you're interested. I'm like, how much? He's like, 30 cents. I'm like, dude, that's thirsty as fuck. You know? So, yeah, that cop freaked me out. There's never cops up in this area either. You know, I'm not doing anything wrong. Sober. I don't have anything bad on me. But it's just that PTSD, you know? It's like knowing that cops have fucked my life up so many different times, you know? I've gotten arrested and haven't gone home for years, shit like that. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. I wonder if I'm going to run into him again. Anyway. One day. So I probably met this guy... The refry wars is probably going on for like two or three weeks. I'd be like, "What's up, Henry?" He'd be like, "Hey, Ryan." He was like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh, super depressed. One day I sat next to him and I was like, "Hey, I stole a bottle of wine from my parents. You want to drink with me?" I swear to God, I did that not to be nice. I legitimately just wanted to know his story because this was. The sorriest fucking dude I've ever seen, right? So, we end up going on this, like, lawn area, drinking wine. Now, the guy was an alcoholic. He must have already been drinking a lot that day. Because for whatever reason, he got, like, belligerently drunk. And he was, like, slurring. And, uh, he, uh, 
he starts telling me about what had happened to him, right? So, forget what kind of job this guy had, but he had some fancy job, you know? Um, forget what it was, but like, I think, I think he was, he like worked for some hotel and he was like the general manager. Ever it was, he was making good money. And uh, he was an alcoholic. You know, he lost his job. And he, he was married to his high school sweetheart. You know, I guess it was some girl that he had been with, you know, since he was a teenager. Fucking thirsty. And uh, when he lost his job, he said that that's when their relationship started really falling apart. They had a kid. They had a son. Um, it's like nine or ten, something like that. And uh, she didn't work. He made enough money where he could support the three of them. They lived here in Santa Barbara. They lived in a town called Summerlin. And he lost his job because he was an alcoholic. And I guess what had happened is they had like some function. That's why I think it was a hotel. Like something like that. Where, I don't know, some sort of like reception, some cocktail thing. And I guess he got really drunk. And he was talking shit to his boss. You know, his wife was there. And he was getting like aggressive with him. Now, you look at this guy. And he looks super unthreatening. You know, he looks like that chomo that works at, or that was like the guy, like Jared from Subway. He's like chubby like that. But he's got this like bristly like overshadow you know the homeless scruff you know but i guess he told me according to him he had gotten aggressive with his boss at this reception and he ends up getting fired and, like talking shit to him drunk he i guess he had like had issues like he came to work loaded a couple times and he was already on thin ice and once he, he lost his job, him and his wife, they had savings. They weren't completely fucked. But I guess his wife really started being mean to him, you know? And I never saw what she looked like or anything. But, you know, um, he would tell me that she was a dime. You know, everybody says that about their girl. You know, I don't, I don't blame him, but you look at the guy... He looks like Jared from Subway. You're like, is she of age, bro? He's like, dude, I went to high school with her. She's beautiful. You know, this was an unfriendly grump. But once he drank wine with me, he got he got friendly. So he starts telling me how she starts like really like telling him how fat he is, and like, I, oh, and he was impotent, couldn't get his dick up. He's like telling me this and like burping wine burps. He's like, my fucking, my cock stopped working. He's like, belches. I'm like, damn. That's fucking disgusting. And, uh, they end up moving into, um, like a hotel, like a, like a monthly hotel. Now, the hotel that they moved into isn't in Santa Barbara anymore. But they used to have these, like, monthly hotels downtown Santa Barbara. And it was cheap, you know, it was the kind of place that was, like, 800 a week or something but it was like an old hotel so it had some of the amenities there's weird phenomenons like that like there's weird hotels that like are shitty you know 800 a week for a hotel is pretty ghetto for a monthly you know it's like usually monthlies are like 1200 a week or something you know like the good ones you're talking about santa barbara you're probably like those prices are ridiculous yeah but santa barbara like the ghetto motels here are like 90 bucks a night you know um th this place you know i guess it was maybe not 800 a week i don't really know that, that this doesn't matter for the story but it, it was not that nice it was like you know but it had like bellboys had an indoor pool had all this shit so he said that you know his kid was like nine and he would go play outside 
you know, they had like this little garden area and because it was a monthly hotel, there were a bunch of families that had kids and all the kids would meet up in the garden. And they'd hang out, you know. Um, so I guess one day, this is after she'd been a bitch to him for a while, he walks out there and she's talking to a bellboy, hot tan dude. He said like in some white outfit that accentuated his tan. I'm not even joking. He said that. I swear I like remember him saying that. And uh, she didn't see, they didn't see him. Like he walked up behind them. So he was listening to their conversation. And I guess there was like a squirrel running up a tree. And the guy was talking to her about it. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I love squirrels. But you know what I really like? A nice middle-aged beaver. And she's like drinking a martini because she was an alcoholic too. And she's like, oh, stop it. You're making me wet. Yeah, saying shit like that, you know? It's like super classless shit. She's like farting. And the husband hears it, right? But he's not, like, if I heard that, I would just run up and take off on the bellboy. Like, no questions asked. I'm not even a violent guy. I just wouldn't tolerate that. <laughs> but he just overheard it. That was, I guess, like the first time, you know? that he had heard him flirting with her and her flirting with him back. So around that time, his parents had money. And I guess like they were both old and they were driving somewhere and they got in a car accident. Now the wife died immediately. The dad didn't. So this is like, well, this dude is living at this hotel with his family and his mom dies. His dad, like, I don't know exactly what, but he had like pretty severe injuries, but like made it. But after that car accident, what he told me is that his dad died of a broken heart within a month, you know? I mean, he'd been married to this woman for a long time. She died. He was injured. He just gave up. So he dies too. Right, this guy's life just sucks. I'm looking at him. I'm like, that's what you get for looking like Jared, you bitch. He's like, what'd you say? He's like, nothing. You want another swig of wine? He's like, yeah, for sure. So he ends up inheriting a bunch of money, like 700K. You know, they had a house and a timeshare you know and he wanted to move into the house move his wife he knew that she was cheating at this point you know she would start telling him that she was going to go look for jobs but it was like seven at night and she's wearing like a pearl necklace and like ruby earrings and shit and he said she'd like be gone all night and i guess she, like her story was that she would go look for jobs in like San Luis Obispo, which is like a couple hours from Santa Barbara. But he knew what was going on. She was fucking the hunk bellboy guy. So he starts accusing her of it, you know? And she's like denying it, you know? And he's like, well, we're moving into, you know, my parents' house because they lived in Santa Barbara. And, uh, and she, she didn't want to move in there for some reason, you know? She wanted to move to um, another place called Camarillo, which is like, you know, 45 minutes south of Santa Barbara. He wanted to move into this house. And uh, they started like fighting about it. And finally she admits to him that she's fucking the bellboy. And so he tells me, this guy tells me that the reason that she told him that is because she didn't want him, she wanted an excuse not to live in Santa Barbara. You know, basically she's having this affair. She wants to get out. She wants to start new. She had family in Camarillo too. That was like one of the things. So this guy 
Jared, we'll just call him. His real name is Henry, but we'll call him Jared because that makes, then you can think of the dude from Subway. Jared is so fucking pussy whipped. He lets her cheat. She's like, yeah, I just won't do it again. He's like, okay, I believe you. Here's 40 bucks, you know, just on some bitch shit. So they start looking for houses in Camarillo. She's the one that sets up the whole thing. Gets this re-litter, like this like um, Persian dude. And, you know, Jared Henry. I don't want to get it confused. Let's we'll just call him his real name. Henry um, told me that he didn't like the, the realtor. He got a bad vibe off him, you know. Felt like a crook is what he said. You know, oh, no, this is a very good place. A very good place. You know, I give it to you for 550 You know, half a million, pretty much. Now, the house that he got, plus the timeshare, he said he got about like 700000 whatever. I guess he leased his, his wife a car. I don't know what they did with the money, but you know, they had enough to buy this house in Camarillo. So the realtor shows them like three or four houses. And there's this one that the wife just falls in love with. And they decide to buy it, right? Again, this dude Henry is just straight up pussy whipped. I would never do that. If che if Karina cheated on me, I don't give a fuck. It's that's it. Game over. Bye bye. I don't cheat on her. She shouldn't cheat on me. And I would never tolerate shit like that. So they they you know they're they're going to buy this house. About to put the money into escrow. And he gets like instructions on how to do it. It's like a wire or whatever to another bank. And they're still living at this hotel, this monthly hotel, where he knows that she's having an affair. And what he says is that she keeps, she continues the behavior. Well, I'm going to go look for a job. We're going to need a new job, you know, buying this house. We're going to have to have money. Like, I, I should get a job. So she ends up going out. He knows that she's still fucking this dude. And he's, like, completely disoriented by it, just distracted. He's like getting this house with escrow. And he does what he needs to do to close it. Gets it all worked out with the bank. Puts it in escrow. And his bank informs him the next day that the money's not there. I forget exactly how, but somehow he got jacked for all that money for like over half a million bucks. Yeah, he's like, he's like telling me about this shit. It's like the crazy, I'm like, what the fuck? He's like, yeah, man, you got any more wine? And I was like, fuck, I swear, I went back to my parents' house and grabbed another bottle because they, they have a bunch of alcohol there. I go back, I keep getting this guy drunk. We're talking for like three hours, you know, he's telling me this crazy story where he gets jacked for like half a million dollars by some Persian guy that he never hears from again. How you get money stolen in escrow, I don't know, but this is what he told me. Just telling you what the guy said. So, of course, his wife, the bitch that she is, this creates this, like, huge fight. You fucking piece of shit, you did this on purpose. You sabotaged our dream home. It wasn't a dream home. It was, like, some fixer-upper in Camarillo, you know? It's like urine fucking colored lawn. And so they're fighting. They literally are running out of money. And she comes to him and she goes, Look, the bellboy loves me. But you gotta, like, this dude, Henry, was probably 50 when I knew him. He said this happened like. 12 years before, something like that. So he was like, you know, in his late 30s. And she was telling, and the bellboy guy was like in his, like, I don't know, early 30s, something like that. No, 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 early 20s. 
he was a lot younger. And she said, she tells him that the bellboy is rich, family, like has family money, and he loves her, and he, he realizes that she's married, and that she has a kid, and that it's complicated, but he's willing to pay to continue to fuck her. Now this dude Henry, right, I'm, I'm drinking, I'm, I'm getting my buzz on now too, I like wanna fuck this dude up for being such a bitch. This dude Henry agrees to it, you know? And so she starts bringing home money. <laughs> like, it's the craziest story ever, you know? And I'm sure I'm fucking up details of it, but it gets crazier. <laughs> so they're living at this hotel. Henry doesn't have a job. He gets like way, way into alcohol again. He's drinking heavily. And his wife is going out every night and bringing home 400 bucks. Like just straight up prostituting, or so she says. Right? So, he said this goes on for a couple months. And it's like paying for, oh, the, the, when he got jacked for the, um, for the half a million for that house, it was insured. So like, he was gonna be able to get his money back, you know? But it was like a long ass process. I don't know what they had to do, but like, you know, he said he was gonna get the money back. So they really had like no options. Like he was such a drunk that he couldn't work. So he was just letting her do this, letting her fuck this dude. So, one day, he goes out, right? Now he starts, oh yeah, yeah, he'd, he'd gone to social services to get welfare. You know, they were like fucked. Like, he wanted to contribute something. You know, the money she was bringing for being a prostitute was like just covering, you know, um, the hotel and like basic needs. But he was trying to get like food stamps so he could contribute a little more. He comes home and he told me that he found his wife and son murdered. Now I'm sitting on this like blanket on this lawn listening to this story. I'm like, what the fuck? What do you mean? He's like, yeah, I walk in to this hotel and she's dead she'd been like stabbed to death butchered is what he had said he said his little nine-year-old son was dead too they had like you know twin beds kids slept on one bed parents slept on the other and they had been murdered you know blood everywhere whatever he said that it was like the most nightmarish thing that he had ever seen you know and, of course, you know, calls the police, gets them involved with it. I was sitting there drinking, listening to this this dude. I'm like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> he gets jacked for half a million and his wife and kid get murdered after she, like, turned into a prostitute. Do you have, you don't happen to have a road flare, do you? He's like, no, I don't use, man. I was like, okay. So... He ends up, this is so weird. So this guy ends up staying in this hotel. Same room, everything, no police come. He wasn't a suspect, he has like an alibi. There's like cameras at the hotel, it becomes this big thing, you know? So it happened like 12 years before I'd met him. So this was in 2006. So this happened in like 94, something like that. So he ends up staying in this hotel, right? He doesn't have money or anything. He's fucking broke. And finally, he ends up getting that money back, you know? However long it took. See, I mean, this is a secondhand story, but it gets, 
I get involved with it shortly. This is interesting shit. This is the like the new one that I was gonna do, but this is like the background information. Karina has something to do with it. Anyway, he ends up getting the money. You know, I don't know how he was staying in this hotel before that, but it, whatever. Maybe they had money saved up for her being a, a pirate hooker. And uh, he doesn't want to leave this room, right? And you got to, at this point, I'm starting not to believe this story that this dude's telling me. But he looks so convincing. He had these, like, sad, like, hound dog eyes. And they look so convincing. It's like, God. This guy just looks like he has hep C, you know? And so I guess, like, because the last memories he had with his family, he didn't want to leave this hotel. Like, it was the last place that he saw them alive. Like, he had memories of getting cheated on, all these great memories, you know? <laughs> and so he, he ends up staying in this hotel. Now, he becomes, like, <sighs> again, this is what this guy tells me. I'm sitting there, I'm just like, dude, I've met some crazy motherfuckers in my life, but this guy is a batshit crazy. This story it does not add up. Like, it just sounds so unbelievable. So, he ends up becoming, like, the classic guy that just lives in the hotel, hermit, only goes out to get peppermint schnapps and shit. That's what it's drink was at that time, he said. So it reminded him of his wife. And, uh, some fucking dude ends up coming like finding him it's like a private investigator i think yeah private like a private investigator and he like knocks on his door and tells him he needs to talk to him he opens the door and this guy tells him that his wife he thinks that his wife and son are still alive after he found them dead in the room Right, this guy's like completely drunk and he's like come in you want some peppermint schnapps and he's like nah so what he tells him is this <laughs> this, is so, this is just so fucking crazy he says that he got hired because pretty sure he's a private investigator you know and he gets hired by some dude in Santa Barbara that thinks that his wife is cheating on him, right? And he shows Henry a picture of the dude that the wife suspects, and it's the bellboy, right? And Henry told me that, it, like, he flew into a fucking rage just seeing it, you know? He never suspected the bellboy for some reason. I'm like, motherfucker, that's the first person I would think did that. And he's, like, showing him pictures of him, telling him what his name is. So I guess the bellboy is from Germany, you know? Or, uh, yeah, somewhere over there. Germany, I think. No, 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 no. Berlin. So the bellboy is from Berlin, you know? And he is suspected of, like, this, of, of fraud. You know, he's, he's, like... He's like being looked at by the feds and shit. He does like this high level fraud. And Henry's like, dude, my kid and my wife are not alive. I walked in and saw them dead. So he's the private investigator, whoever the fuck it was. It might have been a cop. I'm pretty sure it was a PI though. He shows that he shows him that this kid and this chick had gone missing around the same time. Now, they didn't look identical, but they looked similar enough, you know, where, like, I guess it could be passable once they're bloody and shit. I, like, spit my wine out. I was like, oh, <sighs> there's a firefly in here. No, continue. And he's showing, this guy, he, this PI dude is showing Henry 
pictures of this random kid and chick saying that they had gone missing, you know? And they were like, I don't know, from somewhere close to Santa Barbara, forget where, maybe Pismo Beach or something. And Henry, of course, like anybody, would is like crying at this point, telling this dude he's gotta go, you know? He's like, look, you know what kind of sick fucking shit you're trying to run here? But I saw my wife and son dead. I identified their bodies, you know? And he shows him a picture of his wife and son. They're living in a place called Napa Valley, <laughs> or supposedly. And he says that it was them. There are pictures of them and they're with the bellboy. Now Henry's telling me that he, he just can't believe this shit. Like, of course, he thinks that this dude's fucking with him. And like a fucking idiot, at this point, he tells the guy to leave. He tells the guy to leave. The guy's like, I need your help. You have information, you know? You have information to help me get these motherfuckers. So I think it could have been a cop, too. <clears throat> Henry kicks this dude out. You know? And he's like, I never saw him again. <laughs> I was like... What, dude? <laughs> now, you gotta realize, like... I've been through the Mike Virgin stuff. Stabbed the skinhead, done years in prison. It doesn't take, or I mean, it takes quite a bit to freak me out, you know, or like for me to be like, you know, upset about somebody. But this guy weirded me out. And I'm like, look, man, you take all the refries you fucking need, you psychopath. You know, I thought this guy was like a serial killer or something. Seriously. I mean, wouldn't you think that? So, I end up, I was so freaked out by this guy that I stopped going to that spot altogether in like 06, right? He told me never saw the, the PI or the cop or whatever again. I was like, I'm good on this dude. Like, I'm not trying to get extorted out of a half a million or have like some fucking clone double homicide thing happened to me so that was in 06 you know i'd met jenny all this other stuff had happened okay fast forward to 2017 i never saw henry i stopped going there met jenny started selling molly I didn't have to go get refried. I moved away from my parents' house. 2017. Karina and I are at this complex at like 3 in the morning. We're freezing cold. We have a blanket. We're like shivering. And we see somebody walking in the hallway. Now, of course, we think it's security. So we get up and we leave. You know, we hurry out of there. We're cold. We have nowhere to go. So we, like, tough it out for a little bit. Karina's like, I'm cold. I can smell your deck. It smells frosty. I'm like, all right. And we end up going back. And I fucking see Henry. I run into this weirdo again. You know, he looks different. He's like kind of wearing like a Mexican poncho or some shit. Clean shaven now. He's got rim horn, you know, rim horn glasses. He's like, Ryan. And I like, I had not seen, I met this guy or like got drunk with him one time. Talked to him a few times when he would like dwell on the bench. And I looked at him white as a fucking ghost. And like, who is that? Is that your meth dealer? I was like, dude, babe, shh. I, I thought he was going to, like, stab me. And we will get into this little crazy-ass little side epic 
in the next installment of Henry the Weirdo. Palabra, guys.